So this class is about stress and strains in pavements. And we're gonna look into those contents uh, in this class and the next class. So for today, we'll be the first two. Pavement failure, service life, stress analysis in flexible pavements. Next class, in one week from today, we will look into multi-layer elastic and stress analysis in rigid pavements. Now, what is the concept of pavement failure and service life? We talked a bit about this last time, but we're gonna look at it from a more uh, formal way today. Whenever you have the tire of a vehicle that is transferring the load from that vehicle, and let's think of the vehicle as a goods vehicle, freight, tractor trailer, the pavement will experience certain responses. Some of them are stresses and some of them are deflections. When that happens, the pavement will suffer damage over the years of traffic load and environmental loads. To calculate the bearing capacity of a pavement is not sufficient to calculate the instantaneous response that the pavement gives to a given load. We need to estimate the service life and this is the amount of time until a certain degree of damage happens. And this is 10, 15, 20 years, is sometimes as little as seven, depending on the circumstances. The prediction of performance relies on empirical relations between the response and the rate of deterioration. So we're gonna cover and explain further that concept uh, in the future. There are some key questions that the pavement engineer will wonder for a given type of subgrade soil, how thick the pavement layers should be, what roughness, fatigue, or rutting can be expected after a given number of years, how quickly will the pavement deteriorate, and what is the remaining service life after, after a given traffic has used the pavement, how does the maintenance or rehabilitation affect the future performance of the pavement, Will that extend the service life? So the service life of a pavement is a way to estimate for how long the pavement will provide service to the road users. We typically assign a thickness of the materials to accomplish that service life. The structural failure in other engineering fields like concrete, steel, will be an instantaneous event. When the bridge collapses or the beam or the column of the building fails. But in pavements, this damage occurs gradually and slowly and it accumulates and is coming from the traffic load, the environmental factors. And whenever you do some maintenance, you rejuvenate the pavement a bit. The performance of the pavements is influenced by many factors such as the design, the as-built quality, the construction quality, the maintenance and rehabilitation you give, the environmental and the traffic loads. Now damage has multiple aspects. In a pavement, the damage requires the prediction of the functional and the structural uh, deterioration of the pavement over time. So the structural is what we covered last time extensively. It is when we measure the deflections, and we estimate this index based on the flexion basin area. We can also do it through the Benkelman beam and the other artifacts that we saw last time. The functional refers to the other aspects. This is the cracking, the rutting, the raveling, the bleeding, and all the surface functional aspects of the pavement. So the failure in the pavement includes the limiting levels of the permanent deformation that we can tolerate. When we go beyond a certain point, let's put a name, 20% cracking on the surface, 13 millimeters ratting. Okay, when we go beyond those points, we estimate that the pavement has reached the end of the life and has failed. In order to predict the future performance of the pavements, we need to estimate the instantaneous response. And then with that response, we will use some deterministic uh, approaches and some empirical approaches to accumulate that into a permanent deformation. 
And so we will estimate the critical stresses or strains in the pavement to accomplish that. And we will use for that some theory of elasticity that you have uh, learned before, but in anyhow, I will uh, recap with some assumptions to simplify them. So if you remember from your uh, theory of elasticity, you might have covered this before in mechanics of solids uh, or uh, mechanics of materials, I suppose. We have uh, the Hooke's law whenever it is elastic. And that's the main assumption that the material will behave elastically. And then we have the definition of what is an axial strain. It's nothing else than the change in the dimension um, uh, as, as, as a percentage of the overall dimension. And the coefficient of elasticity, which is the stress that is being suffered over the strain. And then we can define uh, the uh, strains in different directions. So it can be tangential, it can be radial, and so on. And we have one amount that is important that is called the Poisson ratio, which is the ratio between the radial strain and the axial strain. Poisson ratio for pavements, something along the lines of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, maybe 0 0.5, but typically it's 0 0.3, 0 0.35. So let's look closely into stresses and strains in flexible pavements. The first theory is old, but is good because uh, it has been confirmed that the results are quite accurate. And is Boussy-Nesk theory. So uh, the assumptions and formulation of this theory is that you have a point load on an elastic half space. A point load is known by you an elastic half space is just a very big space where the load is being applied. And we're looking at this from a two-dimensional perspective. The half space has an infinite large area and depth. So our half space is the soil. And forget about the pavement. Let's imagine that the load is being applied directly on the subgrid soil. So our half space is the subgrid soil and our point load is the point of contact where the tire of the truck touch the subgrid soil. The key assumptions are that this is homogeneous. That means that the subgrid soil is the same type of material, the same degree of compaction. It exhibits constant elastic modulus and Poisson ratio. And so it's an elastic half space. So it's gonna look like this. And you're gonna have here the tire of the truck. And because it's dual typically, then this will be uh, most likely like a circle or quite close to a circle. And that will have a load Q that will be measured in Newtons per square meter. At certain depth, Z, and at certain distance, R, if you take a particle of that subgrid soil, that particle will be exhibiting this uh, sigma z, which is a stress, uh, compressive stress, vertical stress. Then it has tangential sigma t and radial sigma r. And then it has some shear stresses, tau rz and tau zr. So this is known from previous uh, knowledge, and uh, we are gonna take advantage of this, but we're gonna try to learn to estimate what are those values. What are the values of those stresses? And when we combine the stresses, if you remember, I will show you soon in a slide, we obtain strains. And also the deflections can be estimated from this. Now, because this is axis symmetry, there's only three normal stresses, the sigma c, the sigma r, and the sigma t. And there's only one shear stress. This is because the axis of symmetry. And these stresses can be shown to be functions of the load, the uniform load, q, the uh, distance from the axis of symmetry, r, divided by the uh, radius of application of the load, a, and the depth, at the depth at which you are estimating this, z, divided by the radius of the load, a. So I'm gonna show you the charts and that will br uh, bring uh, 
your peace of mind uh, where we estimate these things. So this is one of them. Now let's look at this closely. First, do you notice you have a bunch of curves? And then you have numbers inside the curve. So this curve is 0, 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. This one over here is 1. This is 125. This is 1.5 and all the way to 10. Those numbers indicate the R over A. R is how far you are from the axis or the central line where the load was applied divided by the radius of the load application. So remember, we're assuming the load is applied over a circle. And then these values here running on the, uh, on the rows, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. that is Z over A. How deep is the point I'm interested at divided over the radius of application, okay? Let's look at the next one. Oh, pardon, before we move. This is gonna give us sigma C over Q multiplied by 100. So this is the vertical stress divided over the amount of vertical stress multiplied by 100 and is in percentage. Similarly, we have for the radial stress. Before it was vertical, this is radial stress. But it looks quite similar. You can see you still use R over A, Z over A, and you will obtain sigma C over R multiplied by 100. Finally, we have the tangential stress. It's a similar chart, a little more simple, but it's the same elements. You will have the radius from the axis of symmetry divided over the radius of application of the circular load, A. You have the depth, Z, and again, the radius of the load of application, A. And then you obtain sigma t, the tangential stress, divided over the amount of load that the tire of the vehicle is transferring. This is uniform load multiplied by 100. So vertical, radial, tangential, they all use the same. We have one last one. <coughs> Excuse me. And this also uses R over A, Z over A, and it's giving you the shear stress, okay? And for the deflection, we use this equation that we have here. The deflection W is vertical deflection, W, is equals to the, the uh, uniform load, Q, multiplied by the radius of the load, A, divided by the modulus of elasticity, E, multiplied by a factor, F. The factor F is coming from the chart. So when you know what is R over A and you know what is Z over A, you come here, wherever these two things meet for the specific case you're looking and you obtain F. You use that F in the equation to obtain the deflection. So let us uh, look into an example. I'm just gonna recall uh, in case you don't remember that the strains are a function of the stresses. So the strain in Z, vertical, will be one over the modulus of elasticity, and then this relationship where you have nu, the Poisson ratio, and you have sigma R, sigma T, sigma C, as you obtained from before, from the previous chart, okay? So we can obtain the strains. We don't need to worry about it. It's just a simple calculation. When the load is dual, because you have two tires, which is most likely the case, right? Because you are looking at the axle of a truck. And in the axle of the truck, you will have two set of tires on each end, and they will be transferring certain load. Then we can just use the superimposition of the values, as, we are, as you learned before. I'm going to refresh your memory. So let's look at this example. We will have. 345 kilopascals, that is my Q, for this axe tire of the truck. And it is on a circular area of 254 millimeters diameter. This is the left tires of the truck. On the right-hand side, you have 345 kilopascals 
and 254 again for the uh, diameter of drug. We are going to look into a point that is directly under the axis of symmetry of this left side load. The point is A. And it will be at a depth Z equals to 254 millimeters. The distance between the axis of the left hand side load and the right hand side load is 508 millimeters. Poisson ratio is a bit high, but it's to simplify the calculation is 0.5. And the modulus of elasticity is going to be 69 megapascal. So let's try to solve this. So I'm going to have my left load. And you can see my Q is 345 kilopascals, right? My R for the left hand side is zero because this is directly located on the axis of symmetry, right? My A is the radius of the circular load. And so the diameter is 254, but the radius is half of that. So it's 127 millimeters. My Z is the depth at which I am interested. So I'm interested in point A, the depth is 254 millimeters. Okay, so if I go back to any of the charts, you will see I need R over A, I need Z over A, I need Q, and that's about it. Sorry. So what is R over A? Anybody? Zero. Yeah, zero. zero. Correct, zero. What is Z over A? Two. Two, correct. And uh, I'm going to do it for the right hand side. This uh, sigma Z over Q uh, is the result we're going to obtain in a moment. I'm just going to do the same here. So my R for the right hand side. So that means when I consider the right hand side load, how far is the point I'm interested at from the axis of symmetry of this right-hand side? 508. 508, exactly. My A is the same, you can see here. And that will be the case because you will have always the same type of tires and they will always produce the same um, input, the same circle. So it's at uh, 127, pardon. Yeah. And my C is going to be the same because I'm interested in that point on the left hand side that is at 54. So my R over A is going to have a different value now. What would that be? It's four. Can you guys see why? It's 508 divided by 127, right? Sorry, I need to put divide. Z over A is the depth 254 over 127 is the same is true okay yeah, yeah. same right okay so now let's go back to the charts so remember please i'm looking at zero and two okay mm -hmm. so i'm gonna just put the chart first here and i'm gonna put it in presentation mode so i'm looking at zero okay do we remember R over A is zero and Z over A is two. So this is zero, so it will be here. And Z over A is two, so two is here. So I'm looking at this point and this point. Oh, I cannot make it straight.
Let's put that in red so we can see. And then I go and I hit up there. Where do I hit? Somewhere after 20. Yes. So let's say 25. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Approximately. So that means my sigma over Z is 25. Remember, it's sigma over C multiplied by 100, right? Let's do that for the right hand side. So I'm just going to copy this amount. And I'm going to uh, zoom out here. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to shrink this a bit. So we know that is. Okay, so what will be for this one is R over A4 and Z over A2. So I'm reading now in the four. So I'm reading there, right? Yeah. And then I hope everybody understands what is happening, but I'm then projecting up there. Point eight. No, uh, no not quite, a little less. A little less, point seven, so. Point seven five something. Point six or point seven, point seven. Yeah, yeah. a little less, maybe point seven five. Okay. It's approximate, guys, so don't worry. <laughs> In mm -hmm. this, I'm, I'm not looking for exact values, but it's something like point seven five, okay? Yes. All right. So now I can use superposition. Do you remember what superposition means? Professor? Yes. Uh, why it's saying in multiply by 100 if you are taking the direct values? Because that's what is given there on the chart. Look, that's what is written. That's how they did the chart. That's what it says there. Uh, okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, the sigma z and uh, in the Excel is uh, v z uh, is the same thing. Yes, because uh, the symbol sigma, right? How do you prefer me to say sigma s? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I sigma c, sorry, it's because I don't have sigma. Oh, okay, okay. I do, but if I put sigma, then everything goes into Greek. Okay, thank you. I can try. Let me try. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Ah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Happy now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I was asking, what is the superposition? Anybody remembers? All right, I will remind you. It means you can just make a simple summation of the two effects, okay? So you make that times that, that will give you 0.75 plus 25, right? Yes. And this has to be divided by 100. Okay, so I can add directly this plus that. That way I can increase the plus. Okay, but that's not where we finish. We still have to estimate other values. So we need to estimate sigma r over q, right? So do you remember I'm doing zero and two? Yeah, zero and two. Yeah? Okay, yeah. so let's just bring the arrow quickly. So I'm doing zero and two. That will be roughly there. So I'm reading what, 5.5 .5 maybe? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, so let's write that down. I'm uh, just going to copy this one and replace this C for a T. Professor? Yes. I think the zero is not there. Zero is not there. Oh, maybe it's not. Oh, hold yeah. on, I, I'm getting there. Yeah. Uh, uh, this changed my... There. 
Okay, let's see. Oh, yes, you're right. Sirius is not there. Thank you very much. It's good you perceive that. It's, it's 1.5 something. It's here. Yes, so maybe, let's say 1.4, maybe. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And for the other value, I'm reading four. Do I need yeah. to show you? It's here. Yeah. Four and two, okay? Yeah. So I'm reading four. Four is this one over here. Yeah, exactly. So I will be reading uh, here roughly. So 2.7. Yeah, 6.7 is good. 2.7. 2.7. Okay. So that's 2.7. Yeah. And that will be this one. Yeah. Professor, I, I think it's radial stress or the tangent stress. Oh, this is radial. Okay, let me see. So I didn't check. Oh, yeah, this is radial. Thank you. Yes, it's radial. Ah, <laughs> it goes into Greek. Hold on a second. No. <laughs> ah, gee. Okay, I'm trying, guys, just a second. Let me see how do I trick the system. Uh, like this. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, like that. Okay, but then let me do something because I have to write this one next, right? So let's exactly. put it there right now. Uh, let's put this one here. Okay, so we have uh, sigma. Let's look for sigma t now. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're doing uh, two and, let me just bring the arrow again. So we're doing two and zero. Yeah. And my zero is here. Yeah. So it's a little... 1.78 something 1. like that. 1.6. 6. 6. 1.7. 1.7. Yeah. So. And the other one is four. Yeah. So this is 1.5. This is two. This is 2.5. Where do you think the four is? Do you see the value? Zero, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5. Where do you think the four is? Zero. It's, it's zero, but it's not zero. It's on this line, but this line corresponds to 0.1. Ah. Uh. Okay. So value after 2.5 gonna be 0.1? Yes. Uh -huh. 0.1. Let's copy the value there and copy the plus. Mm -hmm. uh, let's put a different color to this. So I remember I'm adding this with this. And they will produce this as the final result. Let's put a shade. And so I will be adding this plus this. And I will be adding this plus this. Divided by 100. Yes, because as you can see, this is uh, what I'm obtaining from the chart from this is sigma t over q multiplied by 100, right? That's what I'm obtaining. So uh, let's, let me get back in a moment. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just keep it like that for a moment. I'm gonna get back to that. Let's just finish collecting the values. Okay. And then I have the cheer, yeah. which is, uh, okay, let me bring the arrow. Yeah. Two and zero. Yes, yeah, so it's two and zero. Yeah, uh, where is the zero? Uh, hold on, no, the zero is back. Where is the zero? We don't have it here. Yeah, I don't have the zero here. I don't have the zero. Uh, That's at 0.25, it doesn't have zero. We can take maybe just before 0.25. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think we just we just go for the point one to be on the safe side. I don't think there's cheer. Cheer point one. Because it's not there. The other one will be four. Four we do have four. One point five. Uh, one point five. Yeah. So one point five. Mm-hmm. 
here again. Yeah, and then deflection, right? We're missing the deflection. I'm just going to write deflection here. Now, the deflection is a different equation. So what, what I'm getting is the F value, right? Mm -hmm. For now, I will calculate the deflection soon. So let's get the F value. Uh, sorry, let me just bring this. So I have two. And zero. And the very zero. Here, yeah. Roughly there. So I have 0.60, almost 0 0.7, a little less before, 0 0.68 maybe. 67, 66 is fine. Uh, 66. Yes. Okay, 66, fine, no problem. Okay. And now the other one will be with four. Yes. Up here. Uh, a, a little up after 0 0.2, so maybe yeah. 0 0.21. 1 to 1. 1 to 1, yeah, 0 0.21. So 0 0.21. Yeah. Now remember, this is my F factor, what I'm obtaining here, right? You see? Is the yes. F factor. So now I have I have to use that equation, which is the deflection is equals to W is equals to Q times A. Yeah. Yes. All times this F. is divided by E times F by E, and that goes multiplied by F. F. Which we obtain the F, right? Now. Yes. Let me just bring, I'm, I'm just yes. going to put this on the left and the other one on the right. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we have the two Fs, so let's calculate the deflection on the left. So I'm going to say W on the left. On the left. So what is Q? Let me bring here. So we can... Q, 345 45. kilopascals. 45. 345 kilopascals. Multiplied by A. My A is 127 millimeters. Yes. That is the Pascal in millimeters or in meters? Do you remember what is a Pascal? Millimeters. Millimeter. It's Newton per meter. The Pascal is Newtons. And what Pascal else? is to meter. It's yes, square exactly. meter. Exactly. Pascal is to meter, not to millimeter. Point yes. I put that in meters, okay? So I'm consistent with the Pascal. And I divide now by my elastic modulus. Uh, I'm gonna bring the PowerPoint so we can remember what is the elastic modulus. We say 69 MPA. You see it here? Yeah. So let's bring that here. It's 69, but it's Megapascal. Uh -huh. And I have kilopascals. So how can I go about that? Times how much? To make it kilopascals. 10, 10 into power 10 3. 10 power 1,000. Uh, 10 power 3. 100. Yeah. Like that? Yes. Yep. It's fine. And then finally, I have to multiply by my F value. My first F value is point, ah, sorry. So what is my F value? Point 0.7. On the left. Yes. And point 0.21 on the right. You can go and do point 0.7 times all this. Mm -hmm. And then again, and do point 0.21 on this... that. It's a waste of time. We'd rather do the summation of the two Fs by superposition. And now is not the left. It now was is my point seven. It was sixty-seven. Yeah, it, it is rounded. I think because of this. Scale. It is rounded. Yeah, rounded by Excel. Oh yeah, maybe because of the yeah. size of the cell. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. It's the cell. Ah, uh, so it's sixty-six. <laughs> we say. Mm -hmm. So it matches what I have there. Yeah. So. Uh, you can see, you can do it one side and then the other side, but you don't have to. You can just go and do all at once, okay? That's what superposition okay. means. 
Can somebody calculate that, please? Uh, 0.00055. Is meters, right? So you will have 0.5 millimeters, half right. a millimeter. Now let's go for sigma. If you don't mind, guys, I, this is notepad, so I cannot write the sigma symbol, but I'm just gonna write sigma C. Is that okay? I'm yeah. referring to this symbol here. Now I'm gonna add the two of them. So I know that sigma C divided by Q. Times 100. Yes, I'm coming. Times 100 is mm -hmm. equals to and then is 2575, the summation of the two of them, right? Exactly. Yeah. So my sigma, oh, sorry, my sigma C is equals to, so I divide 25.5 over 100, that gives me 0.2575, but I have now to multiply by Q. Exactly. Is that okay? Yes. So it is 0.2575 multiplied by Q, and my Q is 345 kilopascals. Yeah. Kilopascals. Yes. Can somebody give me that value, please? Eighty-eight point eighty-three. Eighty-eight point eighty-three. And what will that be? Yeah, Nieto. Okay, let's think about it. I let you, I, I'm gonna leave the question off. My sigma uh, R will be 4.1. You see here is the summation of the two values. Same story, yeah. And it's the same story. So I'm gonna do it at once. It's divided by 100 and multiplied by Q. Is that okay if I do it at once? It's the same yes. story as before. Yes going to be 14.145, 145. Thank you very much. My sigma uh, T is equals, and then we see here the value, you see you have 1.8. So it will be the same, 1.8 divided by 100, divided by 345 kilopascals. It's 6.21. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, it's what? 0.21. 6.21. 6.21. My chair. Oh, I didn't add it, but it's just 1.6. Yes. And this one I didn't add it, but we did it already up there. So my chair will be uh, 1.6 over 100 times 345. And it'll be 5.52. Okay. Yeah. Now I want to do my strain. So let me get back to the presentation. And I want to do my strain in Z. Okay. Mm -hmm. This one, EZ. Yeah. The first one. Yes. Okay. So it's one over E, and then you have, I'm just gonna say sigma Z minus nu, sorry guys, I don't have the symbol, but maybe the, the V is acceptable in this case, sigma R plus sigma T. Sigma T. Okay, so that is one over 69 megapascal times thousands, yeah. Yeah, times thousands because it's mega, I wanna make it kilo. Mm -hmm. Then I have sigma 
Z, which is 88.83. What is the Poisson uh, constant amount? 12. 12. Which one? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know which 12 you're talking about. The Poisson, Poisson constant. Oh, the Poisson ratio. Uh, we point said 0.5. 0.5, exactly. 0.5. Uh, it's, on, it's on the PowerPoint. Okay, so 0.5. I hope you believe me. It's there. Yeah. And then you have the summation of the other two. So it is uh, sigma r 14.145 plus uh, sigma t uh, 6.21. When I increase here so you can see it. So a strain c is equals to. <laughs> I think it's 1.14 times uh, E minus 3. Right. A strain in R will be the same story. Do I have to do it? No. But the dimension of uh, these uh, final values. doesn't have dimension. Sigma is kilopascal because. Here is also kilopascal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kilopascal. Yeah. That's why I make these kilopascals. Yeah. And then you are canceling. Yes, exactly. Okay. So let me go back here. And let me go back here. Okay. So that is that example. Let me just get back to the lecture. When we are talking about the axis of symmetry, that is the point right below the load, uh, it doesn't matter what depth, the depth will be variable, whatever you want, z. And of course, we're still using a circular load as assumption, and that the circular load is transferring this uniformly. Then under that circumstances, our shear will be uh, going to zero and the sigma r is equal to sigma t, and then there are equations that will give us the principal stresses. So my sigma z is given by this equation straight there, mm -hmm. okay? And the sigma r, which is also sigma t, will be given by this other equation. But again, this is only on this axis of symmetry, right? If yes. you walk away from the axis of symmetry, is not applicable anymore. Mm -hmm. This the uh, epsilon z, epsilon r, which are the strains, are given also by equations. So you can code these equations and obtain them. One plus nu was on ratio 0. 0.5, q 345 divided by e 69,000 multiplied by one minus two times nu 0. 0.5 plus and then two times 0. 0.5 times the depth. I think we say 245, uh, divided over the circular, which is 127 square over Z, which is uh, 254. Okay, you got the point? You just replace the values. But you don't rely on the chart because before we had to go and read on the charts. And the deflection is also given by this expression. You don't need the chart anymore, but you can only use the load on that axis of symmetry. Mm -hmm. If I go back for one second and look at the calculations we have done before, you can see that this one was on the axis of symmetry, right? Yes. And this one was 508, so half a meter away. Yeah. Now you can see that it drops the value. Mm -hmm. in most cases. I think there's a question. Give me a second, please. 113 times 10 to the minus three. Okay, somebody probably wrote to me the answer, sorry. Uh, so uh, I was saying the deflection can be calculated with this equation that you have here. 
When the Poisson ratio is 0 0.5, then you can further simplify the vertical deflection to this expression that you have here. Okay? And again, is Q, which is our uniform load, A, which is the circular radius, E, modulus of elasticity, and that's about it. If you are on the surface of the half space, where will that be? Where is the surface? It will be right here, right? Blue line, yeah. Exactly, it's right here. So that is on the top of the subgrade soil because right now this space or half space is only subgrade soil. It doesn't have any pavement yet. So this is like a mud road where the vehicle is driving on. Agree? So if that is the case, then the deflection is given by this equation. But this is a very important equation because it will allow you to estimate the deformation, instantaneous deformation of an unpaved road, of the subgrade soil in that unpaved road. Mm -hmm. Are we clear? Yes. It's actually it's exactly under the uh, vehicle. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the tire the vehicle, of the vehicle. But not necessarily the vehicle. This red load could be a loading plate, a metallic plate that you apply this Q value. Yes. And then you obtain right. a given deformation. So if we think that this is one of those metallic plates with a dial gauge that will read the deformation, mm -hmm. then that means that you know the amount of Q you're applying, you know the radius of the circle because it's the radius of the metallic plate, you know the amount of deformation because the metallic plate will read it for you. It's like the Benkelman beam. It will read the deformation. Yes. Uh, I should have a figure for that. Uh, okay, I show you, uh, can I, okay, no. Just believe me, those plates will come with a dial. So they will tell you W, the deformation. And which is the value that you don't have? but you can obtain by extrapolation. You can estimate. Will be mm -hmm. the elastic modulus of your soil. So do you see how this equation is now important? Because we'll tell you the bearing capacity of your subgrade soil. You can learn it from a simple test. Are we okay? One question. An example is coming. I'm gonna illustrate yes, that. Go ahead. Uh, these uh, formulas that you mentioned, that is simplified uh, formulas, for just uh, uh, they are applicable for just single axle. Exactly. No, we cannot combine it with other axles. You are ignoring the other set of tires. Okay. You are ignoring just, that. Yeah. Okay. So let's imagine that we have this uh, situation. We have only one load application, the same value mm -hmm. as before, the same distance, depth, the same radius. Poisson ratio has changed to 0.3, same elastic modulus. And we want to determine what are the stresses, strains, and deflection point on this value A, okay? Yes. So, what is the Q? What is my Q? It's 345 kilopascal. Sorry, kilopascal is not correctly written. What is my R, which is the, uh, sorry, is A, which is the radius of the uh, load application? 127. 127 millimeters. Yes. What is my depth? C, I'm going to zoom in. You guys can probably see that. 454. 254. 54 millimeters. Uh, yeah. What is my nu or Poisson? 0 0.3. 0 0.3. What is my. 69 megapascal. Or we can say 1000 K. 
kilo pounds. Yeah. Yeah. What are the units of the Poisson ratio? Nothing. It doesn't have any ratio. Exactly. It doesn't have any units. Yes, yes, you are correct. Of any units. Okay, so we have all the info that we need. So now we go and we use the questions. Uh, what is being asked? Sorry. Uh, determine the stress, strain, and deflection. Z. Q. Somebody has the mic open and I can hear the ambulance coming. <laughs> Big one times one minus C cube. Divided. Officer, I think you need another parenthesis. Another minus before B's. Yeah, another parenthesis. Yeah. Yeah, I probably do. Yeah. Uh, because it's one minus the entire thing, right? Yes, exactly. And then A square. Exactly. Plus C. Two. In power of square. two. Yeah, cool. And, and power of 1.5. Exactly. 1.5. Okay, so let's see where am I closing this? Yeah, it's right. It's right. It's because right. It's, yes, it's red and it's right. And another one after. Another one to fully close, right? Okay, so I have my sigma C. Yeah. Uh, let's go for the next one. It's gonna be kilo Pascal. Yes. Sigma R equal to okay, this is a little more difficult. Minus Q over two times one minus two times nu. Mm -hmm. Yes. Minus. Two times. Okay, do you mind, guys, if I make one plus nu at once? Well, that's this. Doesn't matter. If I made a mistake, you let me know. One plus nu times z. Okay, mm -hmm. that closed the top of that parenthesis. Yes, go ahead. Before the two. Yes. Yeah, before the two. Before the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Open up. The two. two. Mm. Professor, do we need to change the units because we considered earlier in mm, but we are also considering kilopascal. Oh yes, you are right. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm just gonna cancel that, guys. Yes, uh, I probably need to because it's in pascals, right? That's what you meant, correct? Yes, professor. Thanks. Yes, yes, of course, because this has to be in meters. Oops. And this has to be in meters, yeah. Okay, let's go back. Uh, I was saying minus. Minus Q divided by two times. <laughs> Sorry. And times, open the parentheses. And another one, yeah, one plus two times. Poisson ratio and again minus open and another one open. Uh -huh, that's right. Two times one plus yeah. in power Two. of Z. Exactly. Z. Close the close the uh, first. Yeah, exactly. And now A power of in power of two plus Z in power of Z. Two and in power of 0.5 and close, yes, plus, 
I just want to make sure I close the right one. Okay, we will come yeah, back yeah. otherwise. Now open uh, uh, again another parenthesis. Yes, exactly. Z in power of three. Close the parentheses, uh, yeah, and divided by a in power of two plus z in power of two. And another one. That's another. It. Yeah, it's, it's right. Yes. It's right. Yeah. Okay, you got me sweating, folks. <laughs> 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 okay, is it okay if I don't do the rest? But do you get yes. the flavor of what we need to do? Yeah, exactly. Let's do the deflection, okay? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for deflection, I cannot use this simplification because nu is not 0.5, it's 0.3. Very last one, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, am I doing this on the surface? No. 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 Look where A is. Yeah. At a certain depth, so I am not allowed to do that. So I am here, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Fine, no problem. Let's do that one. W equal to, okay, one plus Poisson ratio. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's because I didn't put the equal. Equal, yeah. Poisson ratio, close the parenthesis times. Can you open another parenthesis in the very beginning after yes. equal? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Divided by E now times. Yeah, but I think I need another parenthesis. Let me see. And no, it, it's not required, I think, because now when you. Not because this one closed this. And this one is closing nobody. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. It's right. Now time. Okay. Another one. Uh -huh. A divided by A plus A to the power of two plus two to the power of two, all of them in power and closing integral plus. Another open. Uh huh. Divided by a now close. Uh huh. Times. Mm -hmm. A in power of two plus z in power of two. And now close the parenthesis minus Z. Now we have a problem. I still need yeah, one extra parenthesis here. Now minus Z. Yes, minus Z. But I needed that extra parenthesis there at the front. Yeah. Okay, so this one close okay. that. Now it's fine. Okay, hopefully it is. So this is in meters, right? Yes. We have meters. So let's make that in millimeters. Okay, makes sense. That's about the deflections you will observe. Oh, sorry, ignore that. I already have a file. I'm not sure if it is on Moodle. I think I posted. If not, I will check. I'm gonna put it here on my campus. Oh. I don't wanna risk it with this one, uh, but I will put it in my notes. This is the axis of symmetry file. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Can we make such Excel file for, for our uh, for ourselves uh, to calculate faster in exam? Yeah, sure. I'm actually saying that there's one I have done. I will upload, but you can do it by yourself. And yes, you can use it for exam. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think the concept is clear right now. Yes. All right. Now, there are what we call flexible and what we call rigid plates. Remember, this load is uniform. You can see, right? Mm -hmm. It's constant. 
So when you have the load, what you have is the tire of a car, except if you have that steel plate that I told you for testing the soil. That's a different story. So this is similar to a flexible plate with a radius A and a uniform pressure Q. All we have seen so far is for a flexible plate because that means at the end of the day is like a uniform load applied. But if you have a rigid plate for the deflection, it will not be uniform. I'm going to show you the illustration. Okay. So the uniform pressure we have seen so far is the one on the left and produce this type of deflection. The non-uniform, which is a rigid plate, is this distribution, what it produces. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine why? We have more stresses uh, on the corner seatings. Yes. We need more force to push the, uh, the plate into the uh, basically pavement. These edges of the plate, yeah. pushing that into the pavement requires more yes. pressure to be able to accomplish this. This is why in the flexible, the plate deforms to compensate for the lack of pressure on the edges. But on the rigid, because it's rigid, it will require more. So this is the adjustment that that equation, the last one I show you and I told you it will be for, um, let me see how, do you guys see this uh, toolbar on the presentation? Or maybe it's uh, hidden for you. But okay, can you see the equation now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this yes, is the yes. equation, sorry, it's because in my view was blocked by that. Uh -huh. This is the equation that will give you the pressure distribution on the surface. And this is the one you will use for a loading plate. Okay, the same concept of the loading plate I told you before with a dial and you push mm -hmm. down, this is the equation you will use. For the non-uniform pr uh, pressure. Yes, because it's a steel, it's a yeah. steel point, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, that deflection for that rigid plate, we call it W0, is standardized in certain geotechnic tests and uh, soils testing. And when you get the value of a soil uh, and you don't know where it's coming from, it's coming from this equation, uh, where they use a rigid plate to test the soil and, and give you the value. So let's look at an example, okay? Let's imagine we are putting 8,000 pounds. And let's imagine we have a rigid plate and this rigid plate has 12 inches because the rigid plate has a dial, like a clock, and the dial will measure how much is that deflection when you put those 8,000 pounds down. And it's reading 0.1 of an inch. Poisson ratio, you can estimate this from some uh, testing in the lab, is 0.3. And we are wondering what is the elastic modulus of this subject soil. Can I ask a question? Yes. When, when uh, the, is mentioned uh, the loading test, uh, the plate loading test, gonna be always rigid, yes? Yes, it's oh. always gonna be rigid. Because I should find the image, but I don't know where I have it. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna give it a try, okay? Okay. If it is not the right one, then I just, uh, I just let it go. Okay. Ignore great. everything you see. No, it's not that, guys. Okay, it may be here. Hold on, just give me a second. If it is not here, I desist. <laughs> okay. I know it's somewhere. Is I want to show you the picture. So with the picture, you are. Uh, it will be absolutely clear. Last, last try, last test. <laughs> Ah, there, 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 So you see, this is a rigid plate and this is the dial gauge. Yeah. And with this, you put a pressure down yeah. and then that dial is going to read for you. Perfect. Okay? Thanks. All right. Yeah. 
sure. So, uh, okay, so we're back. So this is what we have exactly now. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's copy the values. Yes. Sorry guys, this computer is not tactile. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a poor professor. <laughs> P is equals to 8,000 pounds. pounds. Yeah. The, uh, the plate has a radius. I'm going to call it A again to be consistent. Okay. Of 12 inches, but it's six, right? Because it's yeah. the radius. Six yeah. inch. Yeah. My uh, W, because I have read it from the dial, is 0.1 of an inch. Exactly. The uh, nu, which is Poisson. Yeah. 0.4. 0.3. Yeah, 0.3. 0.3, sorry. And uh, is there anything else? We need E, basically. We need E, right? But from the P, we can establish uh, Q, right? Yes, exactly. So what will be Q? It will be P divided by? From the equation. Yeah, yeah, from the equation. And e divided right. by E. No, 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 no. Q, the uniform applied load, will be the point load P divided by the surface. Uh, multiple, multiply by A divided to the area, yes. Area, yeah. Divided uh, by the area, yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. what is the area? 8,000 divided by uh, 36 multiplied um, feet. Is by? 3.16. R squared. Yeah, yeah by R squared. Six point yep. uh, sorry, six, uh, Is that correct? Yes. Four, and so Q will be P divided by the area. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. PSI? Pound square inch? Pounds, pound square inch, yes. yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe PSI. Uh, yeah. Can you see it now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put that here because we need it. So the Q is 70.755 pounds per inch. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's go back to the question. Uh, they're asking what is e. e. So we're going to obtain E. So I know the deflection. Okay, let me do it. Uh, let me do it on the notepad. And let me bring my notepad here. So my deflection W is equals to pi. Do you mind if I just write pi like that, guys? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then is uh, this is because this is how you write it in Excel, but I'm just gonna put it like this. Okay. Uh, okay. one minus nu. One minus two. uh sixty. Point three. Point three in power of two. Times times q. You see how we need it, Q? Yeah. Times A. Multiply. Yeah. Divided by. Six. Divided by two uh, multiply to. E. Oh, e. what is my E? Point one. E? No, no, no. We, no, we not E. We need e. e. What we need, the E. But we have to. But point one. W. Point one. One. No, E is not point 0.1. E is what we need. No, no, no. The W is point 0.1. No. The w is point 0.1. Yeah, w is point 0.1. Yeah. W is the deflection. Is point 0.1. Mm -hmm. So we need to solve for E. We agree? Yeah. Guys, they gave us W. That's why I show you the picture because that dial tells you W. Yeah. And when it is you can as change a w. w and E. Yeah, I I once I have W, I can estimate E. So I can change W with E, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So it will be exactly this I thought that it divided was e by the first. So I will I will remove the E. Just bear with me, please. Yeah. One. Yes? This is 
Uh, can you please repeat the value? Thank you very much for six zero six six point six six like that. Yes. Okay. Um, anybody has an idea? What are the units? PSI. PSI. It should be PSI. Yeah, it should be. Yes, PSI. Okay. One question. Yes. When it's W0, it means in the elevation zero, yes? Yes. Ah, okay. Because when you put the plate, it's the, always the, the place where you are measuring the flexion is on the surface. So yeah. that zero means on the surface. Underneath of the tire. No, because this is from the plate. Yeah. If it is a tire, it will be like the Benkelman beam kind of thing. Yeah. Which is doing the same. Do you remember the Benkelman beam? Yes, exactly. I remember. That will be doing the same. Mm -hmm. So the Benkelman beam has also a dial and it has this point, this right here. Between here. the yeah, between the back wheels. Of the tires. Yeah. And this dial is also giving you the W0 because it's on the surface. Okay, I have a question. I guess it'd be better if someone wants to speak. Uh, may I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. Uh, sorry, in the equation 2.2, uh, when we have the load on the symmetry, the axis of symmetry, why before Q we had a, a minus in the equation uh, here, yeah. All, all of them had a, a minus before Q. It's a, it's a convention. Because what is the reason some, of... Uh, yeah, it's a convention because the sigma C is going down on the vertical axis. So it will be going in the negative Y. Mm -hmm. It's just to be consistent with that. If you remember the direction, then it doesn't no. matter. Okay. Where am I? Ah, oh, here. Okay. Uh, it's so we're the going... behavior of the soil against the load. Yes. So far, we have no pavement. Uh, you it's mean only that the, soil. The, the pavement structure okay. will arrive next. Uh, the, the the yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. This this we is have the here. behavior of the subgrade. This is the subgrade mm -hmm. only. So it's like a road yeah. that is only subgrade, doesn't have a pavement. Okay. Now, this theory we have seen so far, which is Busin next, is based on the assumption that the uh, material, the half space, the subgrade soil, is mm -hmm. linear and elastic. Mm -hmm. That's not very realistic, is it? Because you're assuming that is the same type of soil all the way until you reach the core of the planet. That's not true. You know you have stratums, you have different type of soils. And even if it is the same type of soil, it has different degrees of compaction, different degrees of meteorization, and so on. Different degrees of moisture. You guys agree with me? Yes. So it's not really homogeneous. It's not really uh, the same type of material. It changes. So that linearity is not satisfied really. And in practice, uh, most of the soils are not elastic. They undergo some permanent deformation and they're a stationary load and they are not linear. So to account for that, there is a modification on the elastic modulus that is showing this slide where we introduce a property of the soil that we call beta. Mm -hmm. And we introduce also a stress invariant that is coming from the normal stresses. And so this uh, sigma, uh, I, 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 theta, I think is the name of this Greek variable, has the depth of the soil, the unit weight of the soil, and the coefficient of earth pressure addressed, which you can all estimate. And then your beta is a property of the soil that needs to be calibrated so that we can adjust the elastic modulus. 
for now and for this class, I will ignore this. But it's important that you are aware that this is the case. Uh, let me see, should I go into this one? What time is it now? It's 4.11, sir. So I have maybe another 20 minutes. Yes. Okay, now uh, there is uh, a guy called Burmester. In 1943, he proposed a solution uh, for pavements that are uh, treated as layer systems. And he said, better materials will go on the top and uh, not so good materials go down. So that means if you have an asphalt, you will have the best material on the top, which is the hot mix asphalt. Let me zoom in. And then you will have a good material, a fair material, and not something not so good, okay? So you will have your base, you will have your sub base, and then you will have your sub grade soil. So that's what he proposed, okay? And the homogeneous half space does not apply, evidently, as we discussed before. So he developed solutions for two layer systems. And then these solutions are extended to three layer systems. The theory uh, currently can account for as many layers as you want, but we're gonna start looking at two. So when we look at two layers, our two layers to begin with will be like if you have a hot mix asphalt on top of the subgrid soil, okay? Yes. Which is what we call a perpetual pavement or a full death pavement. This is the name that it receives. So we're gonna look at how we analyze uh, the stresses and strains for, for this type of thing, okay? okay? Assumptions. Each layer has a different homogeneous and elastic modulus. Each layer, the material is isotropic. So that means the hot mix asphalt you guys understand what I say by hot mix asphalt, right? Is when you mix aggregates with asphalt binder. That is assumed to be isotropic. So the same properties in any direction and homogeneous. And so the same elastic mode. The subgrade soil will be again assumed to be homogeneous. We know it's not the case, but because the majority of the stress will be absorbed by the top layer, the hot mix asphalt, the assumption of homogeneity on the subgrade soil is not that bad. The material is weightless and infinite in area. So when I'm making this design and I had my hot mix asphalt there, right? And then I have my subgrade soil here, yes? This has a weight, this hot mix asphalt, and this weight plus the load of the truck will come to the soil. Well, we will ignore this weight and we will only consider the load coming from the truck. Are we good so far? Yes. Okay. The uniform pressure will be applied. We will still assume it's a circular area of radius A. We're gonna assume the same as we did before. And there's one additional condition, which is the continuity. The continuity is the interface. The interface between these two materials. Where do you think is the interface? It's right here. It's a line. Or it's better to say it's a surface. It is a surface indeed. I'm trying to represent this Sorry, in two dimensions. It is the bonding between two, two exactly. layers. Exactly. That interface requires bonding between the two materials. Exactly. Okay, so we are going to assume that there is bonding. And so there is continuity of stresses and strains and deflections. Okay? If there is no continuity, then the story is different. So we have something that looks like this. We still have 
the Q, the uniform pressure, the A, which is the radius of the circular area. But mm -hmm. now we have multiple layers. For now, just think about two for now. And we have E1, elastic modulus one, E2, elastic modulus two. Nu one, Poisson ratio one, nu two, Poisson ratio two. And we have two thickness, H1 and H2. These are the thickness we are trying to design for. This is what we're trying to figure out. What is the thickness that I give to the hot mix asphalt? And what is the thickness that I give to the subgrade soil? Okay. Typically, I give more thickness to subgrade, uh, pardon, no, no, we, subgrade soil is infinite. So we are only giving the, the size of the hot mix asphalt for now. When we have multiple and a base, then we will dimension that one. So for us, for now, at the beginning, it will only be this thickness, H1, just H1. for the beginning. Right, because we are supporting directly on super. So this two layer system is what I told you is the full depth. And we're gonna have vertical stresses in the two layer system that will depend on this new amount. Do you remember before we have R over A and Z over A? Now yeah, we yeah. need this extra amount, E1 over E2. And H1. The ratio of elastic modulus mm -hmm. and we will use also the thickness ratios radio which is h1 over a and we have some charts so let's look at the chart this first chart is for vertical stress and so you have e1 over e2 so mm -hmm. this is a value of one that means that both materials has the same same properties elastic modulus now, when the elastic modulus ratio is 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, you still have Z over A, as we had before, you see? And you are still reading up here, sigma Z over Q, but it's not multiplied by 100 anymore. All right? Yes. This one is the vertical interface stress. Please notice I stress the fact that this is in the interface. This is not. And again, you have the uh, ratio of E1 over E2, and you have your A over H1, and that will give you your uh, sigma C over Q, which is your uh, uh, compressive stress. So let's look at an example, okay? We're gonna have one circular load, radius is six, uniform pressure, 80 PSI. It's gonna be a two layer system. You're gonna have a 5,000 PSI elastic modulus for the subject soil. And you're gonna have first a 500,000 PSI for a hot mix asphalt. So at the beginning, at the beginning, we are gonna ignore this value. We will work with that value in a moment. I'm gonna put some color so we don't, so we don't, we don't look into that. Well, I guess that value will do. Uh, we will come to the second question later, okay? So the question is, what is the required thickness? For this full depth pavement. What is the required thickness? That's the question, okay? Okay. So let me let me see if I can do it here. So what are the amounts that I have? Let's see. My Q. Eighty PSI. Yes, I know. Sorry, so I'm just trying to make this a little clear mm -hmm. because I'm not sure if you can see. Um, I have E1. Do you mind if I do E1 over E2 at once? Yes. So what will that be? 500,000 over 500. 500. 100. Yes, it's going to be 100. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I need my A. It's going to be 6 inch. 
uh, do I need Poisson ratio for this? Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm, let me try to fit this light into there. Uh, 80 to layer, we have the ratio. It's not given. Here, they give us this piece of info that is important as well. It must be. Okay, you see this info here? This is important. Yes, and another thing which is mentioned, the sigma C is eight PSI. Yeah, that's exactly that piece of info. So my sigma C is eight. PSI. PSI. What is the meaning of that sigma C? Stress, compressive stress. Oh, due to HMA on subgrade. That is being transferred from the HMA, which is the hot mix asphalt, into the subgrade. Exactly. Yeah. And it is not any single stress, it's the maximum that the subgrade soil can handle, cannot handle more than that. Okay? Yeah. So, let's go back. You mean after this amount, uh, the subgrid soil will be shrink? Uh, it will collapse and fail. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will shrink. Mm -hmm. uh, or settle. Yes, or settle. Let's look at the equation. So. In the figure, we need QC uh, divided by Q. Yes, just a second, just a second. I'm getting there. Uh, so A over H1, what is H1? H1, we don't have it right now. We are finding H1, we don't need yeah. No idea. <laughs> okay, no idea so far. Yeah. What is E over E2? Okay, that one we do. It's 100. So we know we're in this. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, the last one. Yeah. Sigma C divided by Q. Q. We know that, right? Q. Yes. So it is 8. Yes. It's one divided by? Point 0.1. It's point 0.1. 80. Exactly. This line. Yeah. So I am here. Sorry, guys. Let me see if I can change quickly the thickness of this and the color. And the red. Yeah, so you can visualize it. There's further stuff I can do. Let's see what is there. Okay. So do we agree I am departing from point one because that's that amount? And then I have to hit the one over e2 equals to 100. Yes. Which will be that one, right? Number, yeah. And yeah. then I can read back yeah. down into A over H1. So A over H1 is equal to 1.1. Uh, 1.9 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so yeah. uh, I know what is A, but I don't know what is H. I'm trying to solve for H. So H1 is equals to? A divided by 1.1. 1. 1. Yes, so A is by... 6 yeah. divided over 1.1. 1. 1. 1. Equal. Are we good? Yeah, an equal. Yeah. It's 5.5 .5 inch. Thirteen centimeters. That's the thickness of that layer that we require. Uh, for hot mi mix asphalt. For a hot mix asphalt, okay? So I'm gonna remove my centimeters was for my curiosity, but this is for a hot mix asphalt. Now we're gonna do a chip seal. <clears throat> now we're gonna forget about that one. Okay, so what is my A1 over A2 for a chip seal? It's five. Well, five. exactly. Five, right? Yeah. Yes? So yeah. I don't read in 100 anymore. I read in five. 
You guys agree somewhere over there? One, one, one behind that, this line. Ahead. Oh, yes, is the one behind. Thanks. I was, I was putting my head, I don't know if you can see me, but exactly. I was putting my head next to the computer to be able to see it. Yeah. Exactly, it's point four. Yeah, right, point four. So A over H1 is equal. equals to 0 0.4. Exactly. I'm going to just uh, trim this so I can show. And that means my H1 for a chip seal mm -hmm. is equals to 15 inches. Five. Five? No, six. Oh, no, 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 six, yes. 15 inches. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, 15 inches. So it's 15 inches for a chip seal. And five inches for a hot mix as well. It's three times as much. Exactly. A chip seal is just a very thin layer that we use when we don't have tractor trailers. It's only for passenger cars. Does this look like a very thin layer to you? No, quite big. No. Eight centimeters. It's a base it's layer. No, no, but we estimated based on a chip seal. So what is it's the It's like a base. It's very thick. Yeah, 38 centimeters is a lot. So is it possible to use a chip seal for that solution there? Yes. No. Meter time pressure. Can we use the chip seal? Why not? And if you can use a chip seal, what is the thickness? It's very uneconomical here. We can't use a thing. You cannot use a chip seal because the thickness that you obtain using the elastic modulus of the, thick of the chip seal material is 38 centimeters. And a chip seal is something that typically goes along the values of a couple inches mm -hmm. or five centimeters, seven centimeters. No, no, not even seven, five centimeters. So it's wait. All right, let us continue, guys. Uh, there's also the uh, deflection. Okay, mm -hmm. let me put the chart a little bigger. So you see this equation here? Can you see the pointer? Yes. Okay, so it's a similar equation as before. 1.5 the Q, which is the distributed uh, pressure, the uniform pressure, A is the uh, radius of the uh, uniform area uh, uh, load. E2, yeah. who is E2? It's a, a model of elasticity for the second layer. Exactly. And a value that is called F2 that we get from this chart. Mm -hmm. Before I move into the chart, why do you think I have a zero there? Because it's exactly on the subgrade soil. Can it be because and the line the between title. HMA and the uh, subgrade. Under the title. The plate. Yes. It's vertical the surface. is surface deflection. Mm -hmm. It's not interface deflection. It's surface deflection. Okay. Now E1, E2, we know what that is. H1 over A, we know what that is, right? And the F2 will come from the chart. Professor, uh, yes. this uh, W0, it's associated with the uh, surface uh, deflection of subgrade soil or the, for example, the hot mix asphalt, if the first layer is hot mix asphalt. Uh, it will be the hot mix asphalt or whatever mm -hmm. it is on your top layer. Yeah, if it is a chip seal or if mm -hmm. it is a hot mix okay. asphalt. Or there's also warm mix asphalt, which is similar, mm -hmm. but it will be that. It will be that surface up there. Mm -hmm. And it will be amount of deflection that you experience on that. On that. So uh, I do this example, guys, and then we finish the uh, stop the class. Okay? This is just to illustrate that chart, right? So look what we have. We have uh, 20,000 pounds six inches for the radius, 
We measure the deflection because we have a way to know that is 0.1. We know the thickness of the top layer is eight inches. We know the Poisson ratio. We know Poisson ratio for the second layer or subgrid soil, and we know the elastic modulus of subgrid soil, but we don't know what is the elastic modulus of the top layer. Okay. okay. So let me just uh, get the values yeah. quickly. So let's see, we have P 20,000 pounds. A six, six inches, right? So yes. what is my area? Will be I P. times this square. R, yes. So that means my Q, let me make this a little bigger because maybe it's hard to see. Mm -hmm. My Q will be this divided over the area and will be in? PSI. Right? Now yeah. my W0 is given, is yeah. 0.1 of an inch. Yes. My H1, which is the thickness of the top layer, is eight inches. Uh, I'm just gonna do uh, Poisson, we know it's the same, okay? So I'm just gonna write it once. Okay. It's showing uh, by uh, having the same Poisson ratios for both layers. No, it's just a simplification. Mm -hmm. You can have a different Poisson ratio if you want. Is it showing anything? about the structure of those? Okay, we're gonna answer that question, if the Poisson ratio matters or not. Mm -hmm. But keep it in mind. Okay. Am I missing something else in the information? The E2, e right? E2, yeah. 6,400 PSI. Okay, so let's go back to the previous slide. Yes, sir. And uh, can you guys see it? Let me see if I can make you make it a little bigger. Yes. I need to, I'm trying, <laughs> it's like a sinking boat, <laughs> doesn't right. want to go there. Yeah, the thing is, it's oh. Okay, forget about it, I, I, that's the best I can do, okay. So now, um, question, do you see the Poisson ratio in there? No. No, okay, so it doesn't matter. Exactly. No. The W0 is given in four in the terms of an equation. Yes. So 0 0.1 is equals to 1.5 times Q. Q. Oh, sorry, I didn't have a Okay, I'm just gonna type it and then just for yeah. the times A. Which is six. Okay, divided over E2, I know, 6,400, not a problem, mm -hmm. right? And that is multiplied by F2, but I don't know what is F2. You will see from the graph. F2. Yes, we will see from the graph. But can you solve for F2 from this equation? Yes. So if we replace, if we send F2 to the other side, or actually, we will need to send the entire Zero. thing that is in parentheses to the other side, right? Zero is equal Zero five eleven. So I'm gonna take away the F2. I'm gonna say times F2. Mm -hmm. That's the parentheses? Did I did something wrong? 0 0.40 inches. Oh, sorry, F2. Yeah, inches. 0 0.4. 0 0.4 inches. But I'm getting 0.24. No, no, no. You, you need to miss the 0.1. You have to bring it to the... Uh, oh, yes. You miss the 0.1. Yes, but I will send that to multiply the 0.1, right? Yeah. Okay. Sir, uh, I think when we need F2, we have to divide that amount with uh, divided by a point 0.1. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Not yes. multiplying. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, it would 
be divided, yeah, this one. 0 0.5. Exactly, divided by this amount. That's it. That's my, oh. Okay, let's do it like this. That's yeah. F2. Okay, exactly. so now I have my F2. And mm -hmm. so I am in point four, which is here. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know where is my E1 to E2, but I do know where is my H1 divided by A, right? Yes. H1 divided by A is equals to eight divided by six. So it's 1.33. So let me put here a line. 133 will be here maybe? Mm. Mm, two, three, three. One, one on the back. Okay, I'm just gonna make a ticker quickly and, and then I get back to, to move it, okay? Okay. okay? Just give me a sec because I know you can probably, you probably don't see it there. So I'm gonna make it visible there. Okay, so now uh, we said uh, exactly one before this line. That one? Mm -hmm. Yes, That's one exactly. three. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, right. Now F two will be coming from four. So which mm -hmm. e which line am I hitting? Ten. See, I'm hitting ten. Yeah, exactly. Can everybody see that? Because remember, this is 0.4, right? Mm -hmm. So it will cross here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so my E1 to E2 is 10. Mm -hmm. And now I can just solve what I need. What do I need? We need E1. We need E1. Exactly. The only thing is multiplying E2 by 10. Mm, sorry, you confused me there. I know what is my E2. Yeah. So my E1 is E2 multiplied by 10. 10. Exactly. So E1 is equals to 10 multiplied by. That's it. Okay, so that's my E1, 64,000. Yes. Okay, so I will stop the class. Questions, but before I go into questions, I'm gonna stop the recording, guys, because otherwise the YouTube channel is not gonna is not gonna load it. Uh, how much time? Excuse me. Have? Yes. In the last example, uh, the plate was rigid or flexible, because I think that there are two equations for that. One of them for flexible, and another is for rigid pavement. It says rigid plate. Uh, if if it was rigid plate, we had to use 1.18 uh, instead of 1.5 in the equation. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, just give me a second, please, because uh, otherwise the YouTube is not gonna is not gonna accept that. Uh, 